morning. Today I'll be reading out of Exodus chapter 20, verses 12 to 17. That's Exodus 20, uh, verses 12 to 17. And it says, Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God has given you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. Thank you, Zach. Wow, good to see everybody today. You guys sound great today. Good job. Justin, thanks for leading, and man, you guys just sound fantastic today. So we've been talking about basically Ten Commandments since January. Uh, I didn't tell you they were the Ten Commandments, but I suspect that you might have known that. Uh, and there's reasons why, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, today we want to talk about being happy with what you have, even if it looks like this. I mean, he doesn't have much, does he? There's not a lot up there. So, would you be happy with that? I mean, there is nothing. There's not a drawer to put anything in, but that's okay, because you have nothing to put in any drawers. So, there just isn't anything there. And the good thing about that picture is there is nothing there to obstruct your view of the sunset. And I think that's what happens to us a lot, is our stuff gets in the way of us being able to really see God, being able to really notice who God is, being able to see all the great things that God's able to do. And sometimes we just don't even notice that because we get so much of our other stuff in the way. And so we've talked about a lot of principles today, or the past few weeks, about what's core, about how this allows us to change our life, about how it allows us to be better. The first four talk about a relationship with God, to love God, and to worship God, to not have any images, not make any images, to act on the authority of God, to respect God, to keep what's holy, to give honor in your family, and then we come to a summary of all of these. He says, here's what I want you to do is I want you to, excuse me, I want you to honor your father and mother. I want you to not murder, not commit adultery, not steal, not lie or mislead people. And don't want what others have. This is such a strange one at the end because it kind of fills in all the others. I mean, if he says, don't want your neighbor's wife, well, that would be adultery. Don't want your neighbor's stuff, well, that would be stealing. And so it kind of encompasses all the rest of these. But I think it's important for us to realize what he is trying to say. He's saying, don't want what someone else has just because they have it. And we may not have wanted it until we saw them with it. And once we see them with it, then we've got to have one too. I don't know why that is. Why does it come like that? We are in such competition today with so many people just being able to keep up with things. We feel like a failure when we don't keep up, when we don't have as much as somebody else. I was amazed at this, and this is by far not scientific whatsoever at all, but I saw a stat that said, there are seven billion people in the world. Six billion of them have cell phones. 4.5 billion have toilets. And the difference between those numbers is just staggering. Why would you think you needed a cell phone before a bathroom? I'm just saying, I, I don't quite understand this. Does that make any sense? We are going to cover the world with cell phones long before we cover the world with anything else. I mean, that's just the way it is. People know that, people expect that, people have to have that cell phone. 
I know, you're turning yours off right now, right? <laughs> Putting that thing on silence. We don't want that interrupting. So the last command comes out as a negative. He says, I don't want you to covet, but really when we think of it, it's want what you got. Don't want somebody else's. Want what you have, and if you can just want what you have, then it makes all the difference. God gives these as commands from the top of Mount Sinai. These are also principles. These are values. These are the way in which God tries to give us, here's what I want you to know. At the time, this was one of those amazing times where Israel had come out of Egypt. They had come to Mount Sinai, and God had said, I'm going to tell you what I want you to know and so he comes down on the mountain there's earthquake there's been warnings if you touch the mountain you're to be stoned you're gonna die there's smoke there's fire there's all kinds of rumbling going on that's better than a bow's ever thought about being the whole ground is shaking and then he gives you these commands and it scares people And he did it on purpose. Because you see, the next verse after this says, When all the people saw the thunder and the flashes of lightning and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, the people were afraid and trembled, and they stood far off. And they said to Moses, You speak to us, and we will listen. But do not let God speak to us, lest we die. And Moses said to the people, Do not fear, for God has come to test you that the fear of him may be before you, that you may not sin. And the people stood far off while Moses drew near to the thick darkness where God was. They can't hear anymore. They can't listen to anymore. It's just, it's too much. It's too overwhelming. They say, you go talk to God. God at least got 10 things in before they shut him off. We need to be able to hear God. We need to be able to hear who God is. We need to be able to hear what he has to say to us. And whether it comes through another person or whether it comes directly from God in a, in a big cloud and fire and smoke or whether it just comes out of reading your Bible, you need to be able to hear God and what God is saying to you. This is all important for us just to be able to understand what this is about. So can you be scared into behaving Does that work? Is there a parent who hasn't tried that? (laughs) No, we all try that, don't we? We have all got to say something that will scare them into behaving. And it works for about two minutes. And then they realize that, no, you're not going to do that. And even if you do, it might be worth it. And that's when you always know you're in trouble when they're sitting there going, I'm thinking, I can remember this with one of my sons. I was like, well, what are you thinking about? Trying to decide if it's worth it or not. (laughs) I knew I had not given a high enough punishment there. So that's just one of those things that happens to us. Those, can you really scare somebody into obeying? And the answer is no. Because right after this, right after the command, have no other gods, make no images you get the golden calf i mean he's only gone a month and a half and they break the first one and they literally heard it the scariest way you can possibly do it there is no way to scare people into heaven you just can't do it and yet so many times i think we try that let me see if we can't scare people enough to where they'll behave and it just doesn't work if it doesn't work for them it doesn't work for us and especially in our society now it doesn't work that way at all and so he gives you these these are connected with other ones you realize Um, you know don't covet your neighbor's wife is going to be adultery don't steal is going to be don't covet their stuff and so there's things like that that we see but we like We like it when other people like when we have it. They can see what we have, and they go, oh, you've got one of those. Well, it makes you feel important, doesn't it? Makes you feel good. Yeah, I've got this one. This is the new one. This is the best one. This is, wow, I wish I had one of those. 
It's great. We learn to use that. We learn to use that all the time where we like what someone else has. I was at a restaurant one time and the waiter comes over and, you know, it's always that thing trying to decide, what do I want? Okay, I don't know what I want, so what's going to be a good order? What can I order where people won't make fun of me? I don't know if everybody goes through this or not, but anyway, some of us do. So sure enough, you tell him what you want and he goes, perfect. I think, whew. I got the best order. <laughs> I mean, it was perfect. And you think, wow, this is great. I really do a good, good job of choosing, looking at this menu. I got the perfect one. Until the next guy, he goes, perfect, perfect, perfect. I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> Did you know our table is all perfect? Wow, how great a table we have. It took a long time to realize they always just say that. <laughs> but some people live for that status symbol. They live so that somebody else will say, perfect, that's great. Look at what you've got. Look how great this is. Look at how wonderful this is. And so we want the car. It's perfect, right? It's the fastest car around. Why is that important? Because I want everyone to know I have the fastest car around. And what do you do with the fastest car around? You park it. <laughs> well, nobody can see it if it's going by at 150 miles an hour. I mean, you park it so everybody can come and look at it and go, wow, you've got the fast. I know, look at that. It's yellow. Did you see that? This is great. <laughs> And, you know, people want to say, well, you know, you have a trophy wife. I was going to have Nancy stand up, but <laughs> maybe not. There's two ways that can go. You can say, wow, look, he's got the prettiest wife. Or you can say, wow, look what she has to put up with. <laughs> you know, that's always the way it goes more for me. Or you can have the best house. It's fantastic. Now, if you've been to our house, you know this is not ours. This... <laughs> This is the summer place, all right? <laughs> so we always want those kind of status symbols to say, we're important, we have great stuff, and we want you to want the stuff we got. Because if it's turned around, we're going to want the stuff you got. And we always want it to go that way, where we can see that. I'm not sure that helps any of us. And that's what he's saying, is don't want everybody else's stuff. It doesn't matter what they've got. There is a part of this, just to explain how this all works. Paul talks about this in Romans 7. Uh, in verses 7 to 9, it's important for us to realize. So he's drawing a contrast between what the law does and then what the Spirit is going to do in chapter 8. He says, what should we say then? that the law is sin, by no means, yet if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. For I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin seizing an opportunity through the commandment produced in me all kinds of covetousness. For apart from the law, sin lies dead. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. So when God says to you, don't covet what the person behind you has. Right. What do they got? Makes you want to look back and check it out. Why would you tell me not to covet it unless it's something that's really good, right? It's got to be something that's good. And so you want to look to see what it is I'm not supposed to covet. Oh, it's nice. I want one of those. And he says, just the fact that you tell somebody not to is going to make them want to. Really? Are we like that? <laughs> yeah, we are. That's just the way it is. And so let's don't make it a law. He gives you ten things, and I don't want you to make those a law as if God said... 
don't do this. These are values you need to adopt. These are principles you need to take into your life. Are they commandments? Absolutely. Are they a law? Yes, they were. But if I tell you it's a law, you're not going to get this the right way. You're going to say, well, I don't want to do a law. But if you realize this is the stuff that life is about, and this is what makes all the difference for us, and this is going to be what gives you happiness, and this is a way to pursue a foundation so that you can change at anything that's going to give you what you want and make you pleasing to God, then maybe we can understand it that way a little bit better. But as soon as somebody says not to do something, well, then obviously we want to do that. But look at all of these and look at the positive side of what they're trying to talk about. Because this idea of coveting and wanting what somebody else has is just always there. It starts from the time we're little kids. You watch little kids walk into a room and they're eyeing each other. Which toy are you going to go for? And as soon as one goes for a toy, the other one's going to go for the same toy. It's amazing to watch how that happens, and it starts very, very early. Someone else always looks happy. Like, why are they so happy? They're, they're happier than I am, I think. Well, what do they have that I don't have? Well, they got more friends than I've got. Well, if I had those friends, then I'd be happy. And so we set about trying to take away their friends so we can be happy because... If we had those friends, no, it doesn't work that way. It's never going to be that way. Yours is always better than mine. And I didn't know mine was bad until I saw yours. <laughs> and then as soon as I see, well, mine's bad, then I'm not satisfied with mine. Then I want one like yours, and I want one better. I don't just want one like yours. I want one better than yours. So we do this all the time. It's been explained this way. The grass is always greener on the other side, right? I don't understand why that is, but this is just the way it is. This has been taken several different ways. That's barbed wire. Why would you go through that in order to get, boy, that other grass is always better, isn't it? And so if you've got four cows in the corner, it's going to look like this. Because nobody can stay in their own pasture. We've all got to go over and eat somebody else's grass. And so that's one of those important things to realize. And then, uh, this has been quite a few years ago, but Irma Bombeck came up with the, the best title, The Greenest Grass is Always Over the Septic Tank. <laughs> and when you realize that, maybe you don't want the greenest grass over there. <laughs> okay, here's the last one. The grass isn't greener on the other side. It's greener where you water it. And you need to know that, first of all. So if you'll just put the right emphasis in the right place, then that's where you were going to find satisfaction. So why shouldn't we want what other people have? Isn't that what makes us reach for things and do better? Well, first, I think it's probably an insult to God. Because he gave you what he wanted you to have. And we're saying, God, that's not good enough. I want what they have. Because I don't want what I've got. I want what they have because they've got more. Theirs is shinier. Theirs is look, looks prettier. Or theirs is more my favorite color. Or theirs is... And so we decide, well, I don't want what God gave me. And we're not thankful at all because we want to have what somebody else had. Paul writes in Philippians, he says, I've learned the secret of being content. And that's, I can do all things through Christ. And it doesn't matter whether I have or whether I don't have, I've just learned the secret of being content. And contentment is not so much about having, it's about the fact that Christ is powerful in my life. And so when we can get past the idea of having, making us better, making us more focused, it doesn't really work that way. I think we are where we are because of the choices we made, whether good or bad. I mean, if you made a lot of great choices, you are where you are because of the choices you made. And if you've made some poor choices or you're not where you want to be, it's probably because of choices you made. Now, not always. Some people run into obstacles and things like that. 
But the good part about that is you can do something today. You can change that. You can decide, I want to be somewhere else. And you can make a plan and decide, here's what I'm going to do to get there. Hopefully it doesn't have to do with, well, just because somebody else has it. Because then you can get to where you were intending to be and then realize, you know what, this isn't what I want at all. I don't know how many kids I saw in college went through college and started toward a major and they get to the major and get out and they worked a year and said, man, I don't like teaching. There's kids. Who knew that? I don't want to do this. And so then they went back and had to do something else. And, but we think we know where we want to be and so it's important. We can choose. The third one is that life is not fair. Uh, you just have to know that. It isn't fair. It's never going to be fair. And it's never going to be fair for you. It might be fair for everybody else, but it's never going to be fair for you and me. That's just the way it works. It's never about how much you have. It's never about how fair it is. It's never about things being even. You will never get a cure by chasing what you want. You need to take a hard look at your life and say, why do I want it? And if the only reason I want it is because you have it, I just have to wait a little while and you'll get a new one and then I'll want that one. And it's a never-ending thing. So what does Jesus say? Matthew chapter 5, and there are a whole list of Beatitudes there, but two specifically. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. That would be good, right? To inherit the earth, have the whole earth. He said, it comes by humble, meek people. They are the one God gives it to. It's not the ones who go take it over. Those people get caught and captured. They go to war. And the ones that are left are the meek who inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. How many times can you see something that says, this will bring you satisfaction? Okay, a lot of times on the TV, right? Everything's going to bring you satisfaction. Just buy this, get this, do that. It's all going to bring you satisfaction. But this is where God says, here's what does it, is when you want the right thing, when you hunger and thirst for righteousness. He says, when you're anxious for that, it's the most important thing in life, and we find the right thing, we find satisfaction, we find contentment, we find what we really wanted. Jesus calls it rest for your soul. Those who are burdened, heavy laden. He says, you got to want me. If you want me and take my yoke, he says, you're going to find rest for your soul. There's one parable he tells in Luke chapter 12, which illustrates this so well. In verse 13, he says, someone in the crowd said to him, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. And he said to him, man, who made me judge or arbiter over you? And he said to them, take care and be on your guard against all covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told them a parable saying, the land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. And God said to him, fool, this night your soul is required of you. And the things that you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. I don't think Jesus had anything to covet, did he? He didn't have anything. He was like the first picture. The only thing he had was his cloak, and at the cross they 
cast lots, they gamble for that. I guess they all wanted it. But he didn't have anything that anybody would want, and yet everybody who knew him wanted his life and were willing to give up theirs to follow him because he had found something beyond stuff. He had found something worth living for. He had found a way of living that was so much better than theirs. It was not about what they had because he didn't have anything. The guy comes, he says, tell my brother to divide the inheritance. In other words, life isn't fair. And Jesus says, be careful, guard against all kinds of covetousness, basically greed. That's really what it is. It's much easier to say it that way. Jesus doesn't want to be the judge. He says, I'm not going to judge. Why should you be concerned about money? Why should you be concerned about what's fair? Why should you be concerned about your rights? If you pursue any one of those things, you are never going to find God because all of those things lead you further away. You can get the money from your brother and lose your brother. So if that happens, have you really won anything? Wouldn't it be better to have the brother and maybe not have the inheritance that's due you? So we don't take what's ours, so that we don't demand our privilege, our rights, our stuff. But maybe we keep some relationships that would be so much better than anything else we could have. His solution is tear down, build bigger barns, because it's all mine and I'm going to keep it. And God obviously says, no, you're not going to keep it. God unbalances the scales once again, just when you think you've done well. And certainly he had benefited from God, benefited from his crops, benefited from all of his hard work. And at the end, he says, man, I've, I've got so much. Where am I going to keep all my stuff? And the answer might have been, why don't you share with somebody else? Why don't you pay some other people better? Why don't you be able to distribute when your barn's full, your barn's full. Give to somebody else for a change. But somehow that's very hard for us to say, no, I've, I want to have more and more and more so people will know I've got it. Right? Why else would we want to have so much? It just makes your insurance go up. It makes all the other things that you have trying to build stuff to keep all the place and everything else. And then you have to clean it all up and you have to dust it and you have to do all that kind of mess with it. It'd be better to cut down a little bit and not quite have so much because it's never going to be about the stuff you have. When Satan comes to tempt Jesus, he says, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. And Jesus says, you know what? Nothing with God is better than all the kingdoms of the world. I'm not going to take that shortcut. I think a lot of us today in America would take that. Absolutely. What do you mean? I can have everything? I can have it all? You could win the lottery. How long does that last? Maybe two years? And people are more broke than they ever were when they first bought the ticket. Why is that? Because we're going to go get all the stuff that we don't need so other people can look at it and say, wow, they've got stuff. Somehow, God has so much more than that. I saw this one. Some people are so poor, all they have is money. Maybe that puts it in perspective a little bit. Wouldn't it be better to have more than just money? to have some people, to have some friends, to have some real relationship. And so like the passage says, what does it mean to be rich toward God? It means salvation by grace. It means that, you know, we have responded to God and to the death of Jesus. We have humbled ourselves to repent of our sin, and we're not chasing stuff anymore because that's what got us in trouble in the first place. We're baptized, and we want to die to that old self. That old self is the guy who wants all this stuff. And we say, no, I'm going to 
kill you off because there's no way to keep up with it. You just want more and more. And so the blessings that are given by God, the answered prayers, but it's not just answered prayers so I can get more stuff. You understand it's answered because I can have a conversation with God. And how amazing that is to have somebody who has absolutely your best interest and wants to do everything possible, maybe by limiting what you have so that you don't let it get you in trouble. To be able to have the peace of God that rules in our hearts rather than the confusion of trying to keep all of our stuff together. To have faith, being able to live in an impossible world so that we believe beyond the things in this world and we see something more. To have forgiveness, to have redemption, to have a life in heaven with God, to have things of real value like love and joy and peace that we're able to get through the Holy Spirit. As we respond to God, he gives us all those things. Today, I hope you've got a lot of stuff. And I hope it's all you want. Because after all, you came here to worship God. The question is, are you rich toward God or are you worried about your stuff at home? Did you lock the door? If somebody takes it, is it going to be bad? Can God bless you more than anything else? Are you rich toward God? Well, if you're not, we want to help with that. Absolutely. Make a covenant with him today. Come while we stand and sing.